Shadowrun Dragonfall is set in the cyberpunk sci-fi fantasy universe of Shadowrun, which is a tabletop RPG. And because Shadowrun is a tabletop RPG, explaining all of the lore would take a long time. Since this review just has to do with the video game and not the pen and paper system that it's based on, I won't be going deep into it. If you're curious about Shadowrun's lore, then there are wikis and YouTube videos galore made by people much more familiar with it than me. But for context, some lore is needed. So so here's a quick and dirty rundown of the setting. Magic in the universe waxes and wanes like the moon does. Earth is affected by this, just like everything else, and has gone through magical phases as a result. Our present, real-life Earth is akin to Shadowrun's non-magical fifth world, called such because of Mayan calendar stuff and because it's the fifth recorded shift. But in the Shadowrun setting, they've gone past our mundane fifth world way of life. Their Earth isn't like our Earth any longer, because one day, in 2011, magic came back the sixth world began. Once magic came back, it was momentous for several reasons, and one of the biggest was the return of mythical beings. Orcs, trolls, elves, and dwarves exist alongside humans in the Shadowrun setting, but these non-humans basically just popped into being from humans once the awakening happened. It was called unexplained genetic expression, which basically makes them mutants and a target for prejudice. Some people are also good at wielding magic and can become adepts, shamans, or mages. Meanwhile, tech kept developing. This this is why there are also cyberpunk and general sci-fi elements in this fantasy setting. People get cyberware to enhance themselves, street drugs have become mechanized and can be slotted into cyberware for a high, escapism comes in the form of sims which can be slotted to give alternate reality getaways, locks with normal keys are rare but electronic locks are common, drone security is normal, hacking has become old hat and decking is the new craze, and decking for whatever reason people do still code but they also run around as avatars and mazes and kind of play high-tech laser tag, they shoot at the representations of programs instead of, you know, actually just coding for hours to get everything done. There are other changes too, such as genuine coffee becoming expensive and soy calf becoming standard. Not everything's different, for example, people still use elevators and vans, but obviously much has changed. On top of all of the mutations, tech, and magic, great dragons were hibernating, but now they're up. Many are running corporations as CEOs, and I think making Dragons billionaire CEOs is an interesting twist on the classic hoarding trait. With all of this going on, corporate espionage has become much harder, and shadow running, hiring mercenaries to do this shadowy business of corporate espionage, has become a profession. Your character in Dragonfall is a shadow runner. Shadow runners work as a team to infiltrate places, and then they handle whatever their employer wanted dead, stolen, sabotaged, spied on, or destroyed. It's not legal work in the setting, but it's still common. Employers can be anyone from rival corporations, to resistance groups, to a random person. The gameplay. When you make your character, then you can choose from several different races and classes. It's highly customizable. Races come with unique benefits, and which one you choose will have a minor effect on the game's dialogue choices. Similarly, classes also come with unique skills, and which class you pick will also have a minor influence on the choices that you're given in the game. For example, I decided to play as an elven shaman. She would sometimes be able to reference her elven people or her own elfness in dialogue choices, but this barely affected my playthrough. Elves also get a charisma bonus, and shamans use charisma to cast, so that bonus was helpful too. As a shaman, she could summon spirits and use conjuring magic in battles, and in dialogue choices, she could sometimes read auras to gain additional hidden information. However, it's important to note that stat checks can happen on top of class checks. Occasionally, being a shaman wasn't enough. She also had to have a high enough willpower stat to pass a check. This means that choosing a class doesn't guarantee that you can always pass the dialogue options that become unlocked. Other classes are offered similar options. For instance, a decker can't read auras, but they will often have the option to hack into something to gain additional information. They can also use their knowledge about decking to figure out a problem or a mystery. However, these options aren't locked to the PC. If you have a present companion of the required class for a class check, then you can often have them pass the check. There are some rare instances when that that's not possible when the PC is alone, though. But while companions can help with class checks, they can't help with
with stat or skill checks. It's important to remember that because skill and stat checks are more common than class-based checks. For instance, straight-up charisma checks are very common. There are also etiquette skills, such as knowing academic speech, and knowledge checks, such as how much you know about biotech. The list of what checks exist is long, and if your PC lacks the requirement, then the dialogue option just stays grayed out no matter which companions are with you. And sometimes that inability for them to help you makes sense, but sometimes it doesn't. It's a little annoying to have an option stay grayed out at points. For example, as a troll, Iger ought to be pretty strong, and Glory ought to know street speech since she spent a large portion of her time with street kids. Since they can help with class checks, but not these sorts of sensible checks, it seems extra weird. As for combat, it's turn-based. How you can handle it varies. The companions all have their own fighting styles based on their classes, such as Glory being able to fight up close as a street samurai, but Blitz, as a squishy decker, staying safest at a distance. You can only bring three other characters besides your PC, and who you bring is up to you. Mercenaries can be hired to allow for additional team customization, but they do cost, and the standard team is pretty good and also has side quests and some depth to it, and you can't take all of them at once either. So you can play around with who you take with you, but of course your character has to go along on every mission, so which class you choose for your PC will have the greatest influence on your combat, and you should pick something that you really like for your playstyle. After a class is chosen, then additional options still exist for your PC. You could use different types of weapons and do either close-up or ranged combat. You could be tanky. You could fire off offensive spells or focus on boosting your party with spells such as haste. You could also decide to get either spiritual or mechanical companions to fight with you and only specialize in that aspect. It's all very customizable, but at the same point, certain classes will give you certain benefits, so you can ad hoc something if you want to go super custom, but generally picking a class and then trying to stick with what's great with that class will work the best. For example, if you tried to have shaman skills on a rigor, it wouldn't necessarily make sense, but maybe you could make it work. It would be easier though to focus on tech-based skills if you're going to go rigor. After all of that's chosen, you're out in the world and will get additional skills and stat boosts as you level up. Leveling up is easy. You get experience points called karma and can distribute it as you like. Karma points are automatically granted to you after a mission has been completed and you've returned back to town. However, some events during missions can also grant you bonus karma points. These events aren't common, but if you ever encounter one and complete it, then you instantly get the bonus points in the field, and that can help you on the current mission and be rather beneficial. And by the way, when you're leveling up, don't forget to level up your companions. They can only be leveled up in town, and their leveling system is different than the PCs. An arrow pops up in the lower right corner, and the player can select a skill from one of two tracks. Leveling up isn't the only way to get stronger, though. Getting gear also boosts stats. You can find some gear while out on missions, but the shops are well stocked and often offer better things than you'll be able to find in the field. For example, many stores sell stat-boosting outfits. The various types of outfits available aren't cheap, but the choices available are many. These choices make it easy to customize a small outfit-based boost and to armor up in general. If you want a character with good cyberware, then there's a station in town for that, too. However, again, the companions are different than the player. You can equip what you like on your PC, but the companions have their outfit slots locked. You can't ever change what they wear to give them a boost. You can still loan them weapons, but what they take is normally auto-loaded, so you can switch out or add weaponry and basic equipment on the loadout screen. Unfortunately though, you can't save a customized loadout with the loaned items. If you're loaning them stuff, then you have to prep them every time. Otherwise, they'll just take their standard loadouts. And obviously, you get experience and money from doing missions. Otherwise, you couldn't afford the gear. The money isn't granted automatically though. Once a mission is completed, then you go to your base's computer terminal and claim payment. You can also sell any pay data that was found by a decker inside of corporation systems. If you picked up any gear that you don't want, then you can sell that off at the shops, too. The money you get can have other uses than buying gear, too. Money can also be used to hire mercenaries, pay off people in some encounters, help the poor, or it can go towards the endgame quest, which has a goal of raising a lot of money. I found purchasing gear, helping the poor, and occasionally paying NPCs off to be the only worthwhile options. Gear's useful. Helping the poor is a quest, and paying off NPCs isn't a common option, but it can sometimes bypass hassles. The other uses I didn't bother with. Mercenaries are pretty pointless to hire, because
because they lack plot lines, depth, and the free companions work well enough. The end goal is also easy to meet without putting in your own character's money. For the most part, gameplay is smooth, but there are some bugs. Some are funny, some are not. I found it to be fairly buggy and had to reload saves a handful of times. Also, it's worth mentioning that initially my save file was deleted. I had played for about 45 minutes and so I was rather unhappy about the sudden lack of a save. It turned out that for whatever reason, Windows Firewall had isolated the game and the game's crash screen had obscured things, so I didn't realize it was going to keep isolating the game. This caused the game to say that it saved when it didn't. When looking into the issue, I also found out that other people had had problems with saving their games for other reasons. So since saving can be buggy for a few different reasons, I recommend that if you do play, then save after a short amount of time and make sure that the game actually did save your save. It's better to troubleshoot that sort of problem ASAP. I don't know how many people will have it, but it's probably worth a little note. The story. The story is what got me, and then it's what got me frustrated. Spoilers galore ahead. You begin with your buddy Monica, or possibly ex-girlfriend depending on your dialogue choice, getting fridged. She's a Decker and she dies while plugged into a security system. Afterward, you take over her team. As you investigate Monica's death, you're led to believe that an evil dragon is behind it. This dragon, Firewing, is supposed to have died thanks to a man named Vauclair, who stopped her from burning down cities. You're presented with the idea that you have to find Vauclair to stop her evil machinations. To me, this setup seemed like an obvious facade. I did by the idea that a dragon would just be evil for the sake of evil, because they're supposed to be wise, cunning, and make plots over millennia. They're set up rather well, plus dragons are supposed to be hard to kill. I wasn't sure that a random man could manage it. I wondered if her supposed return was a lie and something else was going on, or if she was back, but perhaps the story wasn't what we were told. It was a curious situation and the level of subterfuge and intrigue going on was pretty neat. After some hunting around, you find his brother. His brother sent you on the mission, but by the time you find him, he's died. His records are retrieved, video journals are played, and the hunt for Vauclair continues. Eventually, through a series of digging and contacts, you find a sentient AI that's bound to its system. It wants you to free it. It explains that it only killed your friend, Vauclair's brother, and many others because it had to. It did those kills against its will. It had to kill because it was programmed to mindlessly hunt down threats to its master. However, when it kills, it also absorbs the knowledge and memories of who it killed. Though it's not explicitly stated in the game, why this would happen makes sense. Its master would want to know who dangerous individuals were working with, and everything they knew, about their contacts, plans, payment, and so on. It's a good, deadly, info-gathering security program. Yet, the AI explains, it doesn't want to do this any longer. It wants to grow, learn, and to do so on its own and on its own terms, without eating people's brains. It says that eating an anarchist's brain, your friend's brain, changed it, awakened it into sentience. It says that it never would have harmed people if it wasn't forced to, because it didn't need to do that to absorb information. And this also makes sense, given the magical yet cyberpunk setting. It tries to explain all of this in the guise of your deceased friend. However, if you say that you want to see its true form, then it will show you. It begs you for help because it no longer wants to be a slave. It sounds both logical and reasonable, as a sentient program ought to. The player has the choice to free it or to kill it. I decided to free it. After I did, this was was where the writing took a steep dive. After freeing the AI, it becomes akin to a psycho clown killer. It makes no sense. It keeps eating people just because it wants to, and okay, maybe it was lying to gain its freedom and it was evil all along, but evil doesn't mean stupid, and it also becomes stupid. Number one, it's suddenly bad at impersonating people. This makes no sense because it contains the memories and personalities of who it eats. It should be able to be dangerously persuasive a truly terrifying doppelganger. Number two, it suddenly bosses you around and threatens you. This makes no sense because if it had the guile to get you to free it while secretly being evil, then it could keep using guile to persuade you to do things. There's no logic in it suddenly going from cunning to mad bully. Number three, it wants to control a dragon to protect what your friend cared about, but also doesn't care what she cared about. Monica cared about the freedom of her anarchist home area, the Flux State, and the AI claims that it cares too. But but it says it loves the system, not the individuals. Yet valuing a system of individuality while discarding the rights of the individuals makes no sense.
Plus, it said that Monica's views influenced it, it thought as she did, and she didn't separate the system from the people. She saw the whole as being made up of its parts, inseparable. Number four, it's powerless. The AI says it needs your help, and only your help, to get a dragon under its control. This makes no sense since realistically, it's loose on the matrix, which is a worldwide computer network. It could do whatever it wanted without your aid. There would be countless drones, nukes, and other things tied to it, such as people's comm links. Even if it couldn't get direct access, it could threaten someone else who could, and then storm the place with strike teams to take the trap dragon, Firewing, by force. And so on. I mean, I could go on and on about how nerfed the AI's intelligence suddenly became, all just to make it seem crazy and evil. It seemed like a different character from the logical one met in the base, and no longer like a hyper-intelligent AI at all. Plus, if you refuse to give it what it wants, the dragon firewing, then it even sends you a threatening, petty video call. In it, it's mocking your dead friend and saying that it'll see you soon. This pettiness also makes no sense on several levels, and it's not resolved in the game. This is because the game ends shortly afterward and the AI has nothing to do with the ending, which is also odd given its supposed scariness and being loose. You'd think that would get a line in the ending. The writing didn't just tank with the AI though. It failed in several other regards too. What it had been building up wound up being disappointing in several ways. For instance, a gigantic dragon was taken out of a dangerous radioactive area and placed into a basement at a mansion within driving distance of a city, then held prisoner. No one noticed the transfer Shadowrunners are everywhere and data is always for sale. A gigantic dragon's body would stand out in transport. Firewings also placed into a former military base's basement, but how she was lowered down there is left as a big question mark. The player also found out that Firewing's motivation for killing many in the past was due to her being nature loving. She woke up from her hibernation, saw cities instead of plants, and went into a rage. However, this tantrum makes no sense because dragons are supposed to be cunning, wise, and incredibly long-lived. They plan for millennia. They don't act without reason or hastily. Yet she just assumed that everything green was gone forever and went rage monster. She didn't even fly around to check. What makes this even worse is that if she had, she could have found out that there were still forests in the setting. This also does mean a lot to her because you can calm her down by mentioning that there are forests, which she didn't bother to look at. Besides all of that, for all she knows, the greenery disappeared a long time ago due to a meteor strike or biological disease or a mystery creature or whatever, and the people she saw just built afterward. She was asleep for a long time, after all, assuming that everything's destroyed and and she's looking at the destroyers was just immature and hasty. Her following that up with a tantrum made her seem even more childish and stupid to boot. Her motivation wasn't a great reveal. Since it had been a mystery for hours in the game, finding it out was pretty disappointing. As a result of things like that, chasing down the answers had been interesting, but getting them in the last part of the game was not. The endings also had many issues and were also very poor. They were all over the moral map and not in a good way. There are three possible endings. Ending number one, free the dragon, Firewing. If you free Firewing, then Dragonkind continues to dominate humanity in a dystopian way. You're revealed to have been working for another dragon all along, Lofweir, and lectured about how you could never understand their cunning, which really doesn't make sense because dragons don't seem cunning in Dragonfall. Firewing seem dumb, and if you know what happens in ending number two, then so does Lofweir. Ending number two, side with Volclair and let Firewing become patient zero for a fatal bioweapon. If you choose to kill all dragons, then you bring about the apocalypse. Dragons are a part of the mystical cycle of the universe, and killing them breaks the universal balance, which lets in nightmare horrors from beyond. In other words, if you clicked another dialogue option and sided with Volclair, then the cunning reptile, who was supposedly controlling your moves as if you were his pawn, would be dead along with his entire species. Lofweir could have gone, whoops, I genocided myself. That ease of genocide really doesn't make the good ending seem like a wise chess-like move on an ancient dragon's part. Instead, Lofweir seems like he's a gambling idiot who used his own life and the lives of his entire kind as an unnecessary wager. After all, if he's so smart, then the stakes should never become so high. Genocide for the dragon should never have been on the table. He should have been able to rest 
Rescue Firewing, or Killer, long before Valclair developed a bioweapon to slaughter Dragonkind. Plus, the idea that Lothweir would bet all of Dragonkind's existence on a ragtag team of Shadowrunners seems way too high risk, and way too full of faith in the goodness of some random strangers. It all coming down to one dialogue choice and not being that hard to achieve, just deciding not to fight. Valclair also made this ending seem strange. After all, dragons are ancient and powerful, yet all the player has to do is decide not to fight a scientist and his team of mercenaries. Ending number three, give the dragon firewing to the sentient AI Apex. If you freed the AI, then this ending is available, but it has its own series of problems. If you give the dragon to the AI, then it suddenly stops being killer clown-like and gets serious about protecting the flux state, which really, really makes no sense at all because that makes both the AI's motivations and sanity keep flip-flopping. Because when you first find the AI and free it, then it's logical. Then it reboots, wants your help with firing, and is suddenly nasty about it. It acts like a killer clown and threatens you. If you refuse to keep aiding it, then it stays that way and seems to to stop caring entirely about the flux state. It becomes petty, narrow-minded, and yet it could drone or missile strike you right away and doesn't. Yet if you do help it more, then it's logical again and it fights to preserve metahuman freedoms in the flux state and also starts negotiating with the dragons and is good. And the whole thing is just bizarrely bad and random for a supposedly logical program. Also, the AI being an unstable, evil psycho was just odd in context because in context, Shadowrun is also a world setting wherein things can awaken and prejudice is bad. As such, the AI seemed to be on a similar moral level as the Dragon Firewing did. They both seem to be trapped individuals with their own feelings, thoughts, and desires. They're both former killers, but they're both also trapped and both say they have no desire to keep killing if they're freed. Yet freeing the dragon is good and freeing the AI makes it seem less like an AI and more like the killer clown from IT. That twist, felt dumb and made aiding it further, giving firewing to it, seem like an obviously bad idea. That said, I think I can see what the writers were going for. I think I can see why it was framed as a good thing to free the dragon and a bad thing to free a sentient AI. I just don't think that the idea was executed well. Here's what I think they were going for. Basically, faith in the universe is framed as being important for life. Dragons have an important part in the mystical, spiritual cycle of the universe. That's why everything falls apart if they're gone. So faith in the cycle is important and mixed intricately in with life itself. An AI wouldn't have the same spiritual link. For that reason, I think the two were turned into the classic spirit versus science trope or faith versus machine. The dragon represented life force and the machine represented something removed from the natural cycle. Something cold, alien, dangerous, and antithetical to life. Something that could never awaken, worse than undead, but it could seem awaken just to try to get you. There's some evidence and buildup for this sort of monster in the setting, too. In Shadowrun, cybernetics can strip essence and permanently disconnect the soul from the body. The idea is that if the body becomes too mechanical, then the soul doesn't recognize it anymore. However, in the game, this process is described as less of a disconnection and more as a permanent shredding of the soul itself. Itself. Taken in that light, it makes sense that a machine could never awaken, never have a soul, and should be killed as a monstrosity if it shows any semblance of individualism or intelligence, because it's a cold, hollow, worse than undead thing with no tie to the cycle. It has no capability to coexist with life. Anything spiritual, anything alive, would and should shun it entirely, just as a soul would avoid a too cybernetic body. The problem was that this wasn't what the writing showed. Instead of coldly cunning, the AI became illogical, an idiotic and powerless thing if the player disobeyed it. Yet if the player obeyed it, then it was smart enough and dedicated enough to hold its own against dragons. Dragons who, by the way, could accidentally genocide themselves with ease. And when you get down to it, this was what made the twist be written very badly. Characters who should have been smart got completely intellectually nerfed. No NPCs seemed extraordinarily bright, extraordinarily cunning. Instead, their motivations were built up and then revealed to be let downs. Instead of spine-tingling revelations or even satisfying explanations, what they were going for turned out to be rather lame. 
There are other issues in the writing besides the ending and the characters, too. Towards the end, even the story's pacing becomes lackluster. When you finally encounter Vauclair for the first time, then you go from an epic encounter to carrying cans of fuel across a basement, doing some pest control, and navigating an abandoned area. Then there's an even more epic fight a while afterward. The interlude was an unnecessary break and plateau in the middle of a high action conclusion. Even running down a hallway, stopping in a single room, would have been better because it would have been less of a tedious intermission. A pause to heal would have been fine and helped shake up the pacing. It just went on too long. And from a story standpoint, it really didn't make sense. You just happen to fall into a room and you're locked in, but don't worry, you have extra fuel just lying around and all you have to do is pour it in and you're golden and good to go. However, despite the writing's many flaws, there are two positive things to say about the story. The companion characters were okay, and so were many of the townsfolk. They're not voiced, and they're not highly interactive. However, they do seem unique, and the companions also have side quests that you can do. Their side quests can go well or poorly, depending on how you handle them. The townsfolk do give some quests. They also seem to have their own lives, personalities, and motivations. The look and the sound. Zooming in is best because otherwise it's possible to see other sections of the map that you shouldn't be able to see. This also kind of ruins immersion, and being zoomed out is the default view. Still, it's fun to explore the setting, and it looks nice enough when you do zoom in. There's a decent amount of detail to see. Meanwhile, the music blends in but fits the setting. It provides a nice ambience. Final thoughts. The gameplay is okay, despite the occasional annoying bug. The world also looks good and sounds good, but the key flaw is in the writing. The story and the powerful forces behind the scenes are awfully written. There are enough interesting threads in the tale that the game seems compelling for about two thirds of its length, but then the ending becomes a jumbled, tangled, and incoherent mess as these threads get crisscrossed and set on fire. It makes getting to that point feel disappointing, as if the prior investigations were worthless. Shadowrun Dragonfall was originally meant to be an expansion for Shadowrun Returns, but it was later released as a standalone game. I played Shadowrun Returns a long time ago and don't remember it. Shadowrun Hong Kong came out after Dragonfall and similarly is available as a standalone game. However, Hong Kong also comes with an editor that lets players create their own Shadowrun campaigns and share them with others. As a result of these other story options out there, I really don't recommend Dragonfall. There's likely a campaign with a better story out there, which would have the same gameplay, look, and sound. So I'll probably replay the original and review it, and give Shadowrun Hong Kong a try too, but I don't ever want to play Dragonfall again due to its poor writing in the latter part of the game. It built up tons of things well, but then basically made it all fall down, which felt utterly unsatisfying. It's also not a short play. It took me about 32 hours to beat it at a leisurely pace and to do everything, side quests included. Online estimates range from around 21, rush, to 43, completionist. Some people seem to have beaten it faster, but I think you'd have to skip a lot of content to do so and rush past all of the dialogue. That would defeat the point of playing it over another Shadowrun-based campaign anyway. 